a matter of fact, the enemies of Jesus were criticizing him because he accepted sinners. He sat with the publicans and sinners, and Jesus had already said, I have not come for those who are well, I've come for those who are sick. Some people have a fundamental problem with you embracing people who are not at the spiritual level where you are. The people of God, they were stunned when they saw Jesus sitting with the wicked and evil people they perceived. And, but Jesus knew that every person had value. Every person, every soul was important to him. Because the church itself is really filled with people who have shortcomings. Make no mistake about it. No matter how we dress this thing up and how we look like we have it all together, all of us in this place have some shortcomings. And uh, that's why we declare, whosoever will, let them come. Whosoever's are the people who've done whatsoever, with whomsoever, howsoever they could get away with it. The father or the, or the shepherd who has a sheep, he has a hundred sheep, one of the sheep strays away. He starts with a hundred, one strays away, he goes back and reclaims that, that's one percent. And then you look at how it increases in value again. You have a woman who has 10 coins and she loses one. And then she sweeps the house until she finds it. Now we're up to 10%. And then you have a father who has two sons. And one of those sons goes astray. And now we see 50%. In other words, it really doesn't matter how people try to devalue you or what they've said about you. God sees your value as a human being. There is something great and awesome in your life that God wants to see happen. And the devil in hell is really trying to cause you to abort it, to go down paths of disobedience so that God's will will not come to fruition in your life. People of God, listen very carefully. Luke 15 is really a, a text about the backslider, about those things that are lost and how God can reclaim them. In this text, there are four uh, expressed characters there, in this story. Watch, there's the father who has two sons, and there is a foreigner or stranger that he connects with, the straying son connects with in the text. But there was also an implied character in this story. Uh, he is not named, uh, he is silent, but his strength is in his anonymity. It is Satan himself. Satan who wants to manipulate a boy's emotions and cause him to get ahead of God's plan for his life. And I've come today to expose that devil for who he is and declare that he will not manipulate your emotions another day, that you're going to really wait and learn the power of just waiting on God to bring what he promised you to pass. Some of us have been in messy relationships. We got messy jobs, all kind of mess. It doesn't make a difference what kind of mess you're in. The good news is that his mercy can meet you in your mess. Now, wait a minute. Some of you may not really be really grabbing what I'm saying because maybe mercy doesn't ring a bell for you, but let me tell you what mercy really is. Mercy is leniency and compassion shown toward offenders by one charge with administering justice. I want freedom from you and freedom so I can do my own thing. Here is a son who literally approaches his father really saying he's implying that daddy I'm really tired of being attached because being attached makes me have to be accountable. And there are a lot of people up in here who, who hate being attached because being attached makes you accountable to God. And people of God what you will discover is that this kind of spirit runs rampant in the house of God and it's really rooted in a spirit of selfishness. Because notice what he says. He says, give me. Give me the portion that falls to me. Give me. How selfish can you be? And when you begin to think about, here is a father who has worked his entire life to save up an inheritance so that when he passes away, he can pass it on to his sons. And yet, here is a son who is so ungrateful that he literally pressures his father to give to him the sum total of what belongs to him before his father even passes away. And people of God, watch this. The younger son son wanted what the father could give him but he did not want the father and how many people do you know they only want what God can give them but they don't want God they are generations of takers these are people that have forgotten that our very essence is tied to the fact that God gave us what we have our very life is tied to Genesis 2 and 7 that God poured out of himself and breathed into us and every day you wake up breathing God's air drinking God water, walking
walking around on God's land, uh, taking up God's time, uh, going on God's job, uh, on God's dime in school, uh, and yet you have the audacity to always want something from God, uh, but don't want to give God nothing. I'm going to preach this in the house. Uh, we want God to take time out for us, uh, but we don't have time to take out for him. Uh, we want God to give us promotion, but we won't give him praise. Uh, we want God to call our name, uh, but we go and act like we don't know his name. Uh, people of God, every now and then what God will do, just what this father did. Uh, he'll say, all right, if you want it, I release you to yourself. And every now and then the sovereignty of God will just release you to your own disobedience and let you go and let life teach you the greatest lesson of all. Um, everything that glitters is not gold. In verse 13, your Bible says, and not many days after that, the younger son gathered together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal or riotous living. Wait a minute now. Here is the reality of sin's pleasure. And let me just say this for a moment. The father gives this boy all of this stuff because wait a minute, this boy goes to have a good time. And let's be real about sin, y'all. Sin, I know some of us, you know, sin is a bad thing and you shouldn't do it. But the reality of sin is the devil even knows that sin is fun. Now, it may be fun at the front, but it's fatal at the finish. And the devil will package sin in such a way. Now, some of y'all looking at me like, did he just say sin was fun? But you know there was a lot of stuff you did in your old life. It was fun. You wouldn't have done it if it wasn't fun. That's why you're still wrestling with it because it's so much fun. But listen, people of God, here's the issue. You need to know it's only for a season. Because one verse later, in verse 14, but when he had spent all, there arose a famine in the land and he began to be in want. Eventually his money ran out and when his money ran out, his friends ran out. Can I tell you something? He started out with wine, women, and song. Now it's come to weeping, worry, and sorrow. Can I tell you something? You got to be careful because whenever you have a lot of cheese, you attract a lot of rats. Kind of brings to fruition the prophetic word from Isaiah in Isaiah 59 and 2. Your sins, your iniquities have separated you from your God. And then look at his sorrow. Here's a boy who sorted out with everything. He had everything in his father's house, but the Bible says now he's in want. When famine comes, now he's in want. This is what the devil wants you to be because want means you come to a place of desperation as it progresses. And that's what the devil wants to do, takes you to a place where you don't realize that sin has a payday. The wages of sin is death. Sin always has a payday. Oh, yeah, and the sin pays like this, broken lives, ruined marriages, shattered dreams, damaged trust, health problems, hopelessness, depression. That's what sin will do, and sin will cause pain in your life. Look at verse 15. Your Bible says this. I'm in the text. Verse 15, then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him to feed the pigs, the swine. Wait a minute. This is powerful because here, this boy now is forced to be attached to a stranger he doesn't even know. That's that fourth person in the text. This boy now has to be attached to somebody he doesn't even know. This is what desperation will do. It will force you to unusual attachments. And in this season, I hear the Lord saying, be careful who you attach yourself to. Because there are certain spirits that are attached to you and attracted to you. You ever wonder here, thousands of people sitting here today, but I promise you all the messy folk will always find each other. But the pig pen will challenge some things in your life. In this boy's life, he's about to experience four challenges. One, his, his convictions are about to be challenged. The swine will challenge his convictions. He's a Jew, which means the Jews don't intermingle with swine. It's against their whole religion. They don't eat swine. They don't intermingle with swine. The fact that this boy's convictions now have to be lowered in order for him to survive. And he's got to literally put his convictions on the side just to make, make it happen. And this is what happens with so many people. The devil gets you to a point where you lay aside your convictions just doing stuff that you know is inconsistent with what God would have you to do. He stinks now, which challenges his character. Because now he's in the pig pen. Now he starts smelling like it. Either way he goes, he got stink on him. And what am I saying? I'm saying to you that if you've been hanging out in certain environments, <laughs> wherever you go, we smell like where you've been. And I'm not talking about, 
I'm not talking about changing your deodorant now. I'm talking about being careful about the places you've been hanging with. Here we are having a good time. You show up and knock on the door. When you walk in, you change the whole atmosphere because you got stank on you. You got stanky attitude. Somebody know what I'm talking about because your environment is so negative and everywhere you go, you change it. Somebody know what I'm talking about. He's, got, he's in a sticky situation. Challenges his commitment. How does somebody like you get stuck in the mud like this? We can't tell where the mud begins and where you end. How somebody like you with all this destiny and promise in your life get caught up in a place like this? Where's your commitment? I could, I could literally feel my belly. Look at verse 16. He would gladly fill his stomach with the paws at the swanee. He was contemplating eating slop. His conditions now are being challenged. You mean to tell me that I've gotten to this place of desperation that I would literally eat what the pigs are eating? Wait a minute. You know what slop is? Slop is nothing but a accumulation of stuff nobody else wanted. Look at what the devil do. He'll have you satisfied with what nobody else wanted. <laughs> nobody else wanted them, so I guess that's for you. But touch your neighbor, tell him I'm way past slop. <laughs> Ah, oh, tell him I'm God's child. I'm not gonna just settle for what nobody else wanted. Am I talking to anybody up in here? He comes to a place of resolve. I will arise and I'll go to my father and I'll say to him. Now he starts writing a speech now. I gotta get a speech together. Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. See, he comes to this place, and look at verse 19. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of the hired servants. Wait a minute, look at his resolve. He makes up in his mind, I'm tired of living out here. But if you really pay attention to the text, you might see something very, very interesting here in verse 19 that you did not necessarily pay attention to in verse 12. Verse 12, you might notice in verse 12, when he first leaves, he says, Father, give me. But in verse 19, he's going back saying, Father, make me. That's when you know a change has happened in your life. When you can move from daddy, give me, to daddy, make me. Am I talking to anybody up in here today? That's what is amazing to me is that the father runs to meet the son. It would appear that the son, who is the transgressor, would run to meet his daddy. But the son is walking, contemplating. Daddy, he's practicing his speech. I have sinned against heaven and you. And the father sees him. And the father runs to him. And I said, Lord, why did you run to this boy? What were you trying to say to us? And I heard the Lord say, listen, I ran to him because I wanted to make sure that I got in position in his life so that if there were folk that were going to throw rocks at him, the rocks would hit me first before they got to him. Oh my God, look at your neighbor tell him there was a lot of stuff they wanted to do to me, but God blocked it. God stood between me and all of my haters. Every visible sign that he's been in the pig pen will be covered by the robe. And listen, I come to tell somebody that you ought to just thank God that the Lord put a robe on you. Look at your neighbor say, please don't ask me what's under my robe. Say, just thank God that he put a... I just want to thank God that he covered me. Because all of us got some mess under our robe. But what we ought to give God glory for is that he covered us. Wait a minute. To put a robe on us. <laughs> Then he put a ring on him. The ring represents privileges. Now the ring says, you have access to what your daddy had access to. Everywhere you go, because of this ring, you got access. But then wait a minute, what's most interesting though is the shoes. Because the shoes, get some shoes and put on his feet because slaves did not wear shoes. So for the father to say bring shoes to put on his feet, it was as if the father interrupted his little Easter speech. While he was trying to explain, I have seen that I put shoes on his feet because this is my son. And no matter what you've done, I will not unson you. I will not undaughter you. I, I, you cannot unfather me. 
It doesn't matter how bad I'm in your DNA. You're tied to me forever. But I love you. I'm looking beyond your faults and I'm supplying your needs. Put some shoes on his feet. You're my son. And it doesn't matter what people called you. He didn't call him stinky. He didn't call him this or that. He called him son. And you ought to just thank God that no matter what everybody else calls you, it's not what they call you that makes you who you are. It's what you answer to. And what I answer to is king's kid. What I answer to is chosen generation, royal priesthood. Look at your neighbor and say, I know who I am. My new school was saying something like this. You know, this boy prodigal started off like boss, like Rick Ross. He ended up, as Kanye would say, having a problem with spending, but before he could get it, and then leading the life that ended up broke like MC Hammer. Then he found some commonality with Jay-Z having a hard not life. So what does he do? He reaches out to his father because you know he's got a T.I. complex. He's on the road to redemption. Don't want to leave no paper trail. So rather than being rejected, the father treats him like big and small and gives him one more chance. Look at your neighbor and say, I don't care what works for you. Tell him all I know is God has given me mercy in my mess. And I feel a 60-second party that needs to jump off in this place today. You ought to just thank God.